you're watching Fonseca again. Uh, we're going to have some other streams later today, uh, too, uh, from Stuttgart, actually. Um, Sviantek against Traducanu and Kostik against Goff. But for now, it's the 17-year-old Brazilian on our screens uh, once again for the third time this week, actually. One was not planned, but um, it happened anyway because it was raining in Munich. But uh, anyway, uh, it's the match against Alejandro Tabilo in the quarterfinals as Bucharest, of course, today, finally no rain. And they're making up for what they lost sort of on the previous days. Currently, they're already in that... Um, well, basically, the, the bottom half, where Fonseca and Tabilo are, they're playing the quarterfinals, whereas the second round on the top half has already been done today, and they will also be on double duty later. Um, currently, we have Fonseca Tabilo. Of course, the first quarterfinal has already been finished. Uh, Mute against Fucovic, which was won by Fucovic eventually in the in three sets. If, um, well, basically, whoever wins out of Fonseca Tabilo will take on the Hungarian in the semi-finals and uh, why is this one very important for Fonseca uh, currently he is at 240 in the rankings we might get someone still passing him this week especially Jaime Faria with one win Vincent Ruggeri with two wins I think Galbas with, with three wins although that's kind of actually you know that excludes itself because uh, if Faria wins a match then uh, Galbas won't win three of them so it's not that obvious but all in all, um, this is very important for Fonseca because he might make Ron Carlos qualifying if he wins this match. If he doesn't win it, he's going to be like on the verge. Um, at the Australian Open, the ranking that you needed in the end after all the withdrawals, so sort of like, you know, last minute was, I think, 239, which uh, kind of gives you the idea that Fonseca is pretty much right on the cut at the moment. One more win, though, and he's clearly in Roland Garros qualifying uh, and um, well that would be a sensational achievement given even like where he was at the beginning of the season you know how much junior tennis he was still playing last year uh, all four quarterfinals at the slams uh, I think maybe just like three four challenger appearances all year a couple of ITFs in Europe as well um, basically this is his first full pro season. By February, he was also he was already he was still thinking of like going the college route at least for a season, and that of course never actually happened because he just opted to uh, skip that and opted to try the tour uh, in a more like in a heavier schedule, and it's working out great so far. The challenger final in Asuncion, the quarterfinals especially at the ATP 500 in Rio. And now the quarterfinals at the ATP 250 in Bucharest as well. So far this week, Fonseca has beaten Sonego and also yesterday Radu Albot. Both in straight sets, both first set tiebreak. Uh, been playing with quite a lot of margin compared to what we usually know him for. Because we usually know him for just hitting massive forehands and basically the ball striking talent. I feel like this week he's been a little bit smarter than that. And of course, Alejandro Tabilo is also having a very nice campaign. He's won a title already this year, uh, basically situated himself around 40 in the rankings. I think by now he maybe might have dropped a little bit, just a little bit because of the Indian Wells run. Oh, I mean, just, yeah, a tiny bit, really, 41 in the ATP rankings. And, um, well, he only had to play one match because he was seated in the top four here, so he only needed to play one match to make the quarterfinals and face Fonseca, defeating Artur Rindernech in two sets, which I think is a very good win too. 6-3, 6-4, I think, um, without it, without needing a tiebreak. And uh, it's not going to be easy. I think Tabilo is pretty clearly the favorite. But, you know, it's just one match. He is not exactly the most consistent player on the planet. So I do think that Fonseca has a very real shot, shot at making Ron Garros qualifying, at least ensuring it, because... Yeah, as I said, the current position might be enough. It just doesn't need to be. Um, as of right now, of course, we only have the main draw list, which I think uh, currently maybe it stops at like 99 or something like that, which kind of would suggest to you that if we add 119 direct acceptances into the, into the qualifying to that, then the cut would be 
at around 220. Then you uh, also have to subtract uh, the wild cards for Ron Garros. Uh, at least the wild cards uh, for Ron Garros main draw that w- would be in the qualifying normally. So as of right now, without any withdrawals, I would say that the actual cut is like 230. So yeah, I mean, he kind of needs this win to ensure it. Um, otherwise, it's just going to be a lot of nerves and tension. Unless they want to give him a wild card for Ron Garros qualifying, it's... I guess qualifying isn't isn't impossible, but it hasn't really been like the FFT strategy to to go like this. I think they're definitely not going to give him the main draw wildcard. I mean, Alcaraz wasn't getting them. I don't think Fonseca will. <laughs> what a weird cut and mouse point here. It eventually ends with Fonseca on the floor. Uh, the... Yeah, some great reactions at the net from both guys. No one knew at, at some point. No one was really like understanding what's happening anymore. Fonseca ends up doing a bit of a well, can't call it a somersault, but basically just goes on the ground. Uh, looks like it's it's you know everything is fine. He's just gonna wash himself off, uh, wash the clay of himself. Um, for now, we are in the third game. Two holds for both uh, players right away. Two pretty easy holds. After this match, uh, there might be a bit of a break if it's short on center court in Bucharest, and then they will take on. Uh, I mean, they will play um, the one of the top half quarter finals between Francisco Serundolo and, and uh, Mariano Navone. And uh, the other quarterfinal that was set up today will be played on the second court. And that is, of course, Gregoire Barrer against Pedro Martinez. Martin Fucovic, as I said, is already awaiting one of these players in the semifinals. Of course, for Fonseca, this would be a milestone. Tabilo already a couple of semis this year, including a title, but it's not like he's in them every single week at the challenger level either. So it would still be a, a pretty nice achievement for him, even though he only needs two matches to, to get there as a top four seed. Finally, this week, we are also uh, underway in Munich without any further massive weather issues. Uh, currently, it's Christian Garin leading Alexander Zverev by a set. He already defeated uh, Zverev in 2019 uh, at that venue when he won the title. Zverev is also a former champion, 2017-18, so quite a high-quality match there. Earlier, of course, uh, Taylor Fritz defeated Jack Draper 7-1 in the third set tiebreak with uh, Jack basically falling apart, the last winning just one of the last 12 points from uh, Ferdi Love up at 6-5 f- f- in the third. Tabilo seemed to be cruising towards another hold, but like throws in just a couple of random errors and uh, suddenly it's going to be breakpoint Fonseca. Maybe that's just going to be, you know, how Fonseca tries to tackle this. Uh, don't be overly aggressive on return, just see if Tabilo can also um, feed you some errors because, well, as I said, Tabilo certainly can. And this is part of why, like, even though Tabilo is the favorite here, you know, his, his consistency overall is just not that high. Maybe that's going to be a bit of a strategy for Fonseca today. There's a backhand drop shot from Tabilo. After Fonseca was recovering from some of these backhands cross beautifully, sorry, forehands cross court, because of course Tabilo is a lefty. And uh, Fonseca plays a fantastic counter. Then Tabilo lures him into the net, but the Brazilian is on top of it and manages to swat the ball away. So we've got a break for Fonseca early. That's different, I think, compared to his previous two matches here, as both against Sonego and Albot, he had a bit of a slow start. Then once he recovered from it, he kind of ran away with it. But here it's actually him who, um, well, gets a break first. And as I said, from 30 of up, this was a pretty poor effort from Tabilo. But the very last point, he actually played everything kind of spot on. 
Some lovely defense though from Fonseca showing a bit more layers to his game again with the way he turned the rally around. That's not really something he's used to do, he's known for. Um, I'm not ignoring anyone, I'm just... Uh, I'm just uh, reading the chat for the first time here. Hello, Nurlan. Yes. Uh, what player currently has the highest ATP ranking that you never would have predicted they would get this high? Where is Cam Nori at the moment? <laughs> is he still in that group? Probably Cam Nori, right? I mean, currently number, number 31 or something. But if you told me that six years ago, for example, never, right? And that's probably kind of the guy that you have to go for. I mean, when I'm looking at all the other players in the rankings above Cam Nori, every single one of them is like kind of expected, I think. There's a lot of guys who are hailed as big prospects early or where, you know, had a lot of quality, but were like kind of sleeping, like, like sleepers on tour for a while, like Talon, for example, right? Or I don't know. Um, at Chaveri. So probably Nori. Even though right now he's about 30. Is this finally the day where we are going to see Iga gets absolutely demoralized by the one and only Radu? I mean, I, I, I would love this match to be close. I think Iga might have a better shot at losing to Ribakina than Radu Kano. But I would love I would love it if the match was close. I think it's entirely possible. Um, Raducanu, of course, has had some very nice warm up on indoor clay the last three matches. Well, four matches even two in Stuttgart, two in France last weekend. I think we still haven't really seen where Emma would be with a fully healthy year. Hopefully, we get that. She hasn't really posted any signature win this season. Hasn't had a signature run either, uh, which. Um, I mean, she really needs that. I just don't know if this is the moment, but I would love this match to be close, yeah. And what a, what an what an occasion this is as well for uh, sort of two of the most popular players on tour. Cam Nori's exhibit where AES for why Fonseca might have benefited from a year or two in college. I mean, man, if if Cam, no if, uh, Cam Nori was as talented as Raul Fonseca, he would never play college either. That's simply what it is, right? Like, I mean, I know college is a pretty viable path to glory at this stage, and it, it is regarded like this, and it is definitely, uh, well, I mean, it's right, but if you are 17 and you're going to be playing Grand Slam qualifying soon, there's no reason to play college. Like it, it, it's still not really an option for prodigies, right? Like if you're, if you're Carlos Alcaraz, you're not going to be playing college. If you're Joao Fonseca, you're not going to be playing college. That's perfectly normal. I think. you will get a lot more out of just playing on tour because you can trouble everyone. You can trouble literally every single person on the planet. And um, unless you're like not ready for the tour, either game wise or maybe even like in terms of emotional or mental maturity, then that's where you probably can try to go the college route. And, get all that experience and sort of hit back at the tour in a few years when you're more ready for it. But if you're already there, then obviously, yeah, Cam Nori and um, Cam Nori would never be in college if he was as talented as Fonseca. Uh, speaking of Joao Fonseca, seven, the 17 year old saves a break point here. I was trying to really like snap at that inside in forehand at 30 all doesn't work out. Here, keeping the ball a little more within the lines. Gets an error from uh, Tabilo. On serve, he's definitely getting a bit more opportunities to be aggressive so far. We'll see if that actually helps him or not. 
Is that a double fault? No, it's not. Okay. So it's going to be game point Fonseca. I knew it was pretty close. Um, I just wasn't sure if, if it was Tabilo throwing out the return or Fonseca missing the serve itself. So game point to go 3 1 up. Wow. Well, he was not expecting that. I guess, you know, if you're playing a lefty and you go for that sort of serve, you are risking it. Because usually if you're playing that kicker at the right hand side, I mean, basically at the right side of the service box on the out court, you uh, will never really get burned by a huge return. At least you shouldn't. But if you're hitting it against someone like Tabilo, yeah, this might happen. Um, 150 kilometers an hour forehand just flies past you. Oh, that's just insane from Fonseca though on the next point. Takes that forehand so early that like before, it's kind of like Tabilo finished his return motion and then the ball was already on his side again. Absolutely no shot to even attempt to catch it. This is also an aspect of this that I haven't really mentioned this week because I also don't feel like it's absolutely necessary for him this year. But like if uh, Fonseca would win the match today, like we actually could start talking about a top 100 campaign for him already. That's kind of where, he, where his results would put him for now. And given he's already uh, doing this well at this stage of the season like why why wouldn't he keep going but um yeah i mean currently he's 102 in the live atp race but if he wins this match he would jump to around 80 ish so it would be a very clear indicator that something like that is probably possible especially you know as long as the clay season is going on and stuff because i think maybe on hard courts he's gonna have a slightly harder time uh, given that, um, well, his serve might get, might get a little exposed by some of the power hitters and there's just not going to be that much time and stuff. But I don't know. If he wins today, uh, other than making Ron Garros qualifying, we definitely start looking at this as a, as a potential top 100 campaign for him, which would be an insane achievement, obviously. If Iga and Radu play on grass, what that would look like. Um, I mean, I, de I definitely like uh, the chances of Raducanu against Świątek more in any faster on any faster court. And I actually take Stuttgart into consideration as well because it's so slick and, you know, indoors. Uh, so, yeah, I think th these are sort of the courts that their this rivalry might be the most interesting at. Yeah, grass, indoor clay faster hardcore like when they played in indian wells for example like that's no shot for emma but whenever it's faster she can use her timing a little bit more she can just be on the front foot more yeah i mean then she probably has a chance again with with emma we are definitely operating on uh guesswork a bit because we still haven't seen her play that full healthy season like even when she won the us open uh, but I, I am kind of expecting her to be, well, let's say at least top 30 at the end of the year. If she, if she had, if she gets that, if she doesn't have any breaks, we'll see. By the way, love 40 here for Tabilo, two horrific plus one errors again. And there was a net court as well, helping Fonseca. So this is really not going too well for Tabilo now, even though he had a break point in the previous game and was very close to getting back up there with uh, the Brazilian. Now he needs to fend off three consecutive break points. And if he goes one for down, I mean, the set will feel kind of done. Back and drop shot from Fonseca, and he should be able to pick this ball up. I'm not even sure if Tabilo made it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Fonseca was there to clean up anyway. So it is two breaks. Fonseca leads 4-1. And what a perfect start for him that is. Okay, was there anything else that I missed? Emma has been attacking the returns pretty well. I like her back in a lot, says Sean. 
Um, this would be an excellent win for Piraino over Shidek. I mean, Shidek on clay is... I know he's in the semis, but I don't think he's going to be that good, you know. But, um, of course, this is only his second pro event on clay, too. Yeah, that's some very weird opinions, Ghosty, in my opinion. That um, unless Fonseca wins a slam this year, he ain't no prodigy. I mean, we're talking about 17-year-old. That's like, you know, uh, for example, Carlos Alcaraz is no prodigy then. Yannick Sinner is no prodigy then. Holger Runa is no prodigy. I mean... Of course, it's not really a word that's thrown around, that, that should be like getting thrown around uh, to every single young, talented player. But I mean, we're talking about the best there is currently. Like when it comes to players who are not yet, let's say, under 20 and aren't yet at the top level, you've got Fonseca and nothing else, really. I don't know, future number one, but like, yeah, I mean, we're, we're really talking about a prodigy level talent. Still think Radu will I still think Radu lacks a bit of physical strength compared to the top ladies, but she'll get there hopefully. Yeah, uh, like some of the matches this year, especially against Sabalenka at Indian Wells, right? They, they show us that she's not, let's say, you know, it, it would be unwise for now to call her one of the top players in the world. But we also cannot, like, you know, just pretend that her US Open run was an accident or something like that. I mean, the talent is still there. But uh, we also can't be overreacting in the other way. And um, basically that. Uh, yeah, I still don't know what, Ghosty, what you're talking about. So who is a prodigy then? When I Google the definition of the word prodigy, by the way, it basically says uh, someone young with exceptional qualities or abilities. There's even an example on um, on a Cambridge Dictionary about a tennis prodigy, <laughs> interestingly. The 16-year-old tennis prodigy is the youngest player ever to reach the Olympic finals. Of course, when tennis was a little less physical, there were players who were like, you know, 15, 16, reaching the top. It's still possible on the women's side, but we, we, we don't see it anyway. Uh, on the men's, it's, it's probably just impossible these days with how the game has developed physically. And, um, well, if Alcaraz is not a prodigy, then I don't even know if, if there's anyone whom you might uh, call that moniker 5-1 Fonseca in the in uh, by the way and uh, well that rat from Tabilo just continues I mean, I don't even know if I want to get to that, but uh, I, I mean, I don't even know if I want to get into that, but like, 
what are you implying that it it could be anyone in Fonseca's place who grew up on a tennis country club? <laughs> I know, Ghosty, what you sort of think about you know the um, entitlement and like how uh, basically some have it easier than the others, but uh, it's not that obvious. <laughs> that you basically give this everyone the same kind of opportunity and one turns out to be Joao Fonseca and one turns out to be, I don't know, the word number 1,500. And, you know, that's for a reason. And I'm not saying that because of some divine qualities either. I mean, some people are just more talented than, and other, than others in a certain, um, you know, craft in a certain sport. Your hand-eye coordination coordination might be better. You might get, you know, a lot of easy power, despite maybe not having even that strong physicality. You know, you basically, uh, you might have amazing feel like that. These are things that kinda cannot be taught a lot of the time, right? I mean, has anyone taught Yannick Sinner on some country club that he can accelerate through his shots while being like very lanky, like? you know that that's not something that anyone taught him is the the feel for the ball of i don't know carlos alcaraz teachable is that because someone took him out to the courts at an early age i mean there are a billion players who also had similar opportunities and they just don't have the same gift and it has nothing to do with god as well i mean likely everyone has um you know certain crafts in which they are more talented than other people it's just that some of these crafts are a lot uh, less flashy and a lot sort of yeah just don't give you the same opportunities the same money the same fame but everyone has some sort of talent Tabilo approaching the net here. Pretty good touch here on the volley. I mean, he definitely needs a bit of a, uh, you know, just couple of good shots, couple of good points, maybe restart himself a little bit. That's that's going to be like, you know, the, the, the how, how he resets in front of the second set, <laughs> ahead of the second set. That's probably going to be the main um, narrative here as well. At 5-2 Fonseca. Two opportunities to serve it out. The serve seems kind of done. Some crucial moments in Barcelona as well at the moment with Thomas Martin Echeverri being 7-6, 6-5 up on Cameron Nori. That one is expectedly a slog. Uh, it's over an hour in both sets already. Uh, interestingly, last time they played in Buenos Aires in 2023, they actually went on for um, about an hour in the first set two, and then Echeverri had nothing left, which is very uncharacteristic for him. Usually he just loves these marathons and loves all the battles, but that day he wasn't ready for what Nori had to offer. Um, seems like today so far he's holding up okay, though. We'll have to see if uh, Cam can steal that second set or not. And of course, Alexander Zverev, as I mentioned earlier, is also down a set to Christian Garin in Munich in a match between two of the three former champions in the draw. What's been Fonseca's best win in his career? Um, basically, Fields, if we're talking strictly ranking, which uh, I think would still be Fields, right? Because he was like 30-something. But Tabilo would be very close. Last year, he beat uh, Kovacevic, Sabovild. These were the biggest ones. In 2022, he beat Navone and Tirante. Uh, in 2023, he's already got uh, Sonego, he's got uh, Fils, he's got Garin in Rio. This one would be ranking-wise, I think, the second right after 
pa, 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 right after uh, ba, ba, ba. feels, yeah, yeah. Seem very dated, ghosty. I mean, I, I don't mind notes. Uh, you know. I don't mind not getting the same opportunities that Joao Fonseca got because we just got different opportunities. I mean, everyone gets, well, not everyone, okay, not everyone, but someone, everyone gets some sort of uh, an opportunity. Personally, I'm uh, very much fine with how and where I was raised. I don't feel any, um, well, I don't really feel disappointed that there's a guy who's out there and produces magic with his tennis racket. The scoreboard in Bucharest is again really struggling. Uh, and I'm actually not sure if we're, what score we're at now. I think it could be fairly all. <laughs> it's a wild one. Fonseca trying to go for a little match on the four on the plus one forehand now, just into the fence more or less. Um, I would love to know what's what score it is. I think it is break point for Tabilo at uh, two at five two up. At, at Fonseca being five two up, of, of course. Just misses that second that that first serve out wide. And will we get a break back? Fonseca just finding the line with the backhand. Tabilo counter punching now, trying to survive. So far, he's doing just that. Backhand drop shot from Fonseca, but Tabilo should probably track it down. And eventually he does. So I think he has actually restored one break. Yes, indeed, and he's going to be serving at 3-5 down now. Let's see if this is a proper comeback or if it will be thwarted anytime soon. Of course, Fonseca might still get, well, will still get one more chance to serve it out if he can't break here. And yes, like C. Fonseca is the US Open Juniors champ. Last year, he made the uh, quarterfinals at all four slams in the juniors, eventually winning at the US Open over Lerner Teen. Yeah, I mean, um, we don't need to talk about this. We also, but obviously I'm not uh getting riled up or any or anything clearly either so i guess i just like my glass half full or in this case someone else's glass half full So yeah, Tabilo has uh, recovered one of these breaks, lost the first point at 3-5, but for now, uh, he's still going on. The last five minutes, uh, honestly, have been a little error heavy from both guys. I mean, Tabilo clearly just focusing on um, extracting errors from Fonseca in that last game, you know, trying to make his way back into the set. 
hasn't been the most pretty much the last five minutes. And after this ace from Tabilo as well, it just seems like Fonseca will need to uh, serve it out on the second attempt indeed. And if he can't do that, Tabilo once again a little on the front foot, but like nothing exceptional yet. Steps into this back and down the line. Fonseca scrambling around the court and Tabilo tries to throw in a forehand drop shot, short slice. You're get, you're, I mean, I can only guess since it doesn't make it over the net and it was very hard to say what he actually wanted to produce here. I don't think it would have bounced um, to... Uh, short, uh, sh uh, you know, behind the net. So it's going to be 40 30, one more chance to get us to 5 4. And indeed, he fires another ace in that direction. Both serves out wide, down, I mean, out wide, both serves on the outside, down the T, uh, aces. So Alejandro Tabilo gets to 5 4. And this is crunch time. This is when Joao Fonseca can really show us uh, if he's ready for this, if he's ready for taking this set. The previous game kind of went away from him, like, you know, just kind of suddenly out of nowhere, I would say. But obviously at the time he could afford it. Now this is the one where uh, the margin for error is gone. He had some issues, of course. Uh, we were watching Fonseca against Sonego, and he had some issues closing out the first set there, actually quite a lot. First, uh, there was that set point on serve at 5-4, and then eventually there were also the four set points consecutively that he missed in uh, the first set, first set tiebreak. From 6-1, it went to 6-5, and then to 7-5. But eventually he got the job done, so... He'll be hoping to avoid another one. Uh, I don't think that's moving past it, Ghosty. <laughs> if you want to insult me, though, go ahead. Let's see how this attempt to serve it out goes for Fonseca. First point, I mean, I kind of don't like that direction he took on the plus one forehand, but he still gets the point done. Just gave Tabilo a shot to really like reset, maybe come back to the point if he was a little lucky. He wasn't though, so 15 love for Fonseca. The key there was definitely the first serve as well which he also gets in here, uh, this time with a lot of kick to the Tabilo backhand. Maybe this is Fonseca already adjusting to what I said earlier, where like he uh, usually goes for this kicker out wide on the ad court and uh, Tabilo really slaps the forehand. This time he goes into the uh, left hand, left, uh, I mean, right hand side of Tabilo. And another first serve in, which just makes this attempt to serve it, serve out the set pretty easy for Fonseca so far. Three first serves. I mean, he's only had to hit one shot otherwise. Uh, that plus one forehand, that was like maybe a little, you know, not too carefully placed, but it still won him the point. And now we have three set points. Once again, the first serve is in, but it will actually be a rally. And Tabilo gives Fonseca plenty of trouble here with the flatter backhand cross. It's obviously one of his best shots too. Is Tabilo doing good? Um, I mean, the, up until 5-1, he was playing an absolutely horrible match, but he has recovered a bit since, has given himself some hope to maybe come back and fight for it in the second set. But obviously, the, 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 right now, we can see that the first set is done. 
Fonseca with yet another good first serve. Um, kind of, I can't even say if he was getting tight or not in this one because mostly just the, the serving set it up for him and he managed to get over the line. But um, yeah, the last few minutes, Stabilo has seemingly improved a little bit. I don't understand that ghost. I mean, yeah, is is Yun Cheng Shang a prodigy? Yes. Was Ibing Wu once a prodigy? Yes. I don't really see what uh, what that has to do with a prodigy as. Well, the definition of the word prodigy is just someone young having exceptional abilities. And that's it. Whether they're born in Beijing, Rio de Janeiro, or Sydney, that's not really coming into the definition. So I would say that, yeah, guys like Yu Jing Shang, Yi Bing Wu a few years ago, they absolutely were R pro slash R prodigies. Is the water I'm drinking cold? Uh, Called ish, I guess. I poured it from the top. <laughs> I'm just gonna let this, you know, sit on the screen for a moment for a moment. Hopefully John doesn't see it. Or maybe, uh, actually, hopefully he will. And it seems like Thomas Martin and Treveri in Barcelona will clean up this match against Cameron Nori. Two tie breaks, five match points now for Edge. Um, two and a half hours despite just two sets, <laughs> which really you expect that with Echeveri Nori. Can you imagine, by the way, if we got the, these semifinals in, uh, Rio, in, sorry, in Barcelona, Diaz Acosta against Fields? And Arnaldi against Echeverri. I mean, Christmas ca has come early, if that happens. Uh, of course, Arnaldi route might be a bit of a crucial one there, and Diaz Acosta Tsitsipas especially. Uh, but yeah, anyway, let's get back to Fonseca right now. Cameron Diaz over Cameron Nori. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, Cameron Diaz, is, is she a good actress? I think Cameron Nori is a better tennis player than Cameron Diaz is an, is, is an actor, as an actress. I mean, if we were to like rank all the actresses in the world, would Cameron Diaz be in the top 30? I don't think so. And if we are to rank tennis players in the world, then Cameron Nori is in the top 30. And Echeverri has indeed wrapped that up. Uh, that, that's... I don't know, Ghosty. I mean, that's a very weird way to think about this. Obviously, words have their etymology, but like over the years, the term prodigy has... You know, the, the meaning of words evolves, uh, language evolves. And um, if we're calling someone a prodigy, yes, like, like part of that wonder thing is still there because you're calling someone like amazing. You're calling someone uh, talented enough so that others kind of can't reach it because, you know, it's, it's wonderful. But does it still have that religious aspect to it? Well, not in that sense, at least, you know.
you can't just take every single word we're using today and look at where it originated. I mean, languages are alive and over the years, especially over so many years, where I think the, the word prodigy is, has probably been used in this current, like current context, uh, for a few, for a few hundred years now, it really doesn't have much to do with its original etymology. Game for Tabilo already. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of what he'll be trying to do, right? Just stabilize in this match. Definitely avoid what happened in the first set where things just fell apart for him after like a 10, 15 minute rough patch. There were, by the way, like a lot of issues earlier today in Bucharest too, with how the courts were like, um, you know, prepared and they were uh, arguing about this in a match with, uh, in the match against, with uh, Sebovil Navone, for example. Of course, the weather has also been bad all week. It hasn't been a very nice return for the Bucharest event, but maybe actually this is something that can sort of um, save the image of that uh, tournament. Like if Joao Fonseca, you know, keeps going, right? Then then that obviously may, makes headlines. Maybe that can actually um, sort of help out the event too, because for now, uh, well, bad weather, uh, horrible courts. That's kind of what we've been seeing this week. <laughs> And of course, Bucharest is coming back to the ATP calendar for the first time since 2016. Not that it really matters, like it's still going to stay there because Ion Tiriak has a lot of money, but... Has the Napolitano run, sh run shocked me uh, as a whole this year? For sure. Um, I mean, the guy was like, what, 4 and 17 one year in like 2021? Sorry, 2 and 17. And uh, basically, it seemed like his best days are over. But now he suddenly has even a chance to break the top 100 with a title this week. And if he doesn't, then like still one more huge result this year. And he might actually do it. So yeah, it would be one of the more unexpected late breakthroughs. I don't think he's, you know, less talented than a lot of players who have made the top 100 before. But um, at this stage of his career, it definitely seemed more unlikely than not. And if he wins these two events back to back, Madrid and Oeiras, that would be a very impressive feat, absolutely. I don't know if Ghost Thief to even reply to this, you know, seriously, because, well, clearly you have something in mind and it's, um, I don't know if I'm really on that same page with you here. Uh, most of my work is in English because it has a broader audience. <laughs> That's it. I mean, you don't know Polish, so. So I'm streaming in English. I don't think I lost weight. <laughs> so um, I don't know, maybe it's the hair. I haven't changed it either, but uh, yeah, I don't think I lost weight. Broader audience, what does that mean? I mean, it's the language that uh, most people, most tennis fans in the world know, and it's the language that most people share in the world as well. And that's even if you have your own mother tongue, you probably, well, especially in the modern day, modern day and age, you probably also speak English to a decent level. It's the one that's taught in schools. And um, it's the one that's most useful currently when traveling abroad, when talking to people from other countries.
I could, and then with broader audience, I just mean that if I started streaming just in Polish, then the audience would be smaller and would be less diverse as well. Like it would be just one cultural group. Uh, you know, we could get a lot of views on an Iga Świątek match, right? But we probably wouldn't would get nothing on Fonseca Tabilo, for example. Well, I mean, that's kind of how, you know, how it happened throughout history, right? I mean, colonialism and and uh, stuff. I mean, I'm not really one to that that can change the course of history, nor, nor do I want to. Spanish is also very, very popular all over the world. I mean, there are about 25 countries that speak Spanish. Speaking English is not really an economic decision. I mean, speaking English is something they teach you in school. And um, other than economic, it's also social. It's just easier to live in the in a world where you speak English. And when you go abroad, you can talk to someone. You can talk to someone from another country. I mean, for me personally, obviously, English is a massive part of my life. It would look completely different if I didn't know a, a single language other than Polish. So, I don't know. Spanish is uber popular though as well. I mean, over 20 countries in the world speak Spanish as an official language. With China, obviously, it's, you know, the, the problem is that it's just one country. People in my club feel it's disrespectful when they underarm surf, considering no one that strongest surf, that has, has that strongest surf at club level. For the most part, sure, people do it a lot more. I mean, personally, I think that at the amateur level, uh, underarms don't really work that well because um, for the most part, you're not going to be standing on the, at the back fence. Like, for example, I don't know, when I'm playing some opponents, I just pretty much retain from inside the baseline. And you're not going to underarm ace Caroline Garcia, for example. If my opponent is going to be standing far back, uh, to some of my second serves, he wouldn't really get. <laughs> you know, they, they barely get over the, the net. So um, I think underarm serve is actually more successful in the pros than it is in amateur tennis. But I don't find it disrespectful. Like if someone does that, I'm going to attempt to track it down if I don't miss it. If I if I miss it, if I miss the shot, it's on me, right? I mean, he set it up for me. If I if I screw up, that that's definitely my fault. If he does it three times in a row and I miss every single time or like like I lose the point every single time, again, this is something that I should be taking care of. Like he's my opponent is giving me a chance to win the point easily because he's underarm serving. Uh, if I don't capitalize on that, yeah, again, that's that's on me, not on him. Uh, so I don't find it disrespectful whatsoever. But I actually think at the amateur level, it's like not that good because rarely you're going to find people standing so far back to return simply because, as you said, most people at the amateur level have horrible serves, which I think comes from the fact that like if you're not properly training tennis and you're just meeting with people to play, you're never really going to have like, you know, detailed serve practices, right? You're just going to play. You're going to warm up your sh shots, hit a couple of serves, and then you're just going to play. And it's impossible to learn how to serve properly like this. But I, I don't feel like adding more unreturned serves to my, I mean, underarm serves to my game would improve it. I feel like it would actually um, take away for the most part. I mean, if I do it once per match, maybe I'm going to get some decent results with it. But if I was doing it uh, every single game once or twice, I, I doubt it would actually increase my success rate whatsoever. 
Joao Fonseca tried to go for some unconventional shots here. One time it worked, one time it didn't. There was this um, forehand slice slash drop shot that uh, really confused Tabilo. And will he get the game? It's backing down the line, forehand cross now, getting Tabilo to slice and cleans up the point too. Nice combination. And again, like not really going for his crazy accelerations. That's been the case throughout the week that he's at least trying to hit with more margin. And it is two games all. So uh, for now, the second set is definitely going a little different. Yeah, basically what I said, Sean also commented. Oh, yeah, um, I, I think Lob is actually the most overpowered shot in amateur tennis, yeah. Uh, first of all, most people can't smash. They also won't be as effective running around. Uh, basically, they, they, yeah, they just won't put you away. The approach shots usually aren't that good. Like, Lob kills the point every single time. It's it's basically impossible for you to like, sorry, not impossible, but it's prob it's probably not worth it ninety percent of the time to go for the pass. Uh, lob is safer and more effective. And even if you're not deep, even if they get a chance to smash, as you said, most people just will struggle to put it away anyway. So uh, I think lobs are definitely overpowered in. Um, in amateur tennis. Um, I don't know if it's about liking smashing, but it seems like the easiest shot on the, uh, you know, in the sport, like you just come up and whoop. But uh, actually you see a lot of amateur tennis players, myself included, who can't smash for S. And um, well, I think it requires just kind of a lot of good setup you need to, you know, start from your back, uh, set up well for it. food, food, uh, you know, in terms of your feet as well. Uh, have a lot of good, like, sense of feeling of where the ball is going to land, when it's going to land. I think it's de deceptively easy. Uh, I think it's deceptively tough, actually. And, um, yeah, I think if, if you know how to do it, if you feel comfortable on it, uh, and... If your dad made you do that smash practice, then probably you are, and then you know he kind of gave it uh, gave that ability to you then. But I uh, I don't feel comfortable smashing at all. So if it's like in a match, this is the shot I always uh, kind of just um, am worried about. You know, there's a lob from the opponent. I know I can smash it, and I already expect to miss it. If I let it bounce, maybe it's a little better. <laughs> The sort of forehand return winner down the line that Tabilo hit uh, Fonseca with in the first set now gets repaid. I mean, the favor gets repaid here with um, it's with Fonseca going for pretty much the same, but it's still 40 30 for a Chilean. Who's trying to pressure the Fonseca backhand, gets the youngster on the back foot. But it's decent recovery from Fonseca. And I think he's going to win the point, in fact, with this last forehand on the line. Yes, indeed. So we are a deuce. Um, I thought that maybe he was going to miss it because this was like a common thing where you're late to like five shots, but you get everything back. And then suddenly you finally get an opportunity to hit your, uh, you know, to hit what you want, to, to have a lot of time on the ball. But uh, no, he managed to handle that okay, actually. So we are a deuce and things might be getting tricky for Tabilo again. Let's see. Oh my goodness, did he miss that? The umpire is going to check the mark and it's in. Woo. Yeah, that's quite a key one. I mean, that was a forehand into the open court that Tabilo just barely touches the line with. Could have been breakpoint from Seca. 
but instead we're going to have an opportunity for the Chilean to go free to up. Tabilo, by the way, I mean, I don't know if it's relevant here, but um, always a good fun fact that he was actually born in Canada and he represented that country in in the juniors as well. So, you know, compared to most players from um, his um, part of the world, I mean, he definitely has a more aggressive, hardcore oriented, even sometimes play style. I mean, he's still best on clay probably, but um, a lot of how he plays tennis is sort of explained with that Canadian influence too. And um, as this is basically where his tennis journey started, I think he only moved to Chile like five or something years ago, maybe a little more. I, I don't think a backhand volley is tough. I think a backhand overhead though is, is probably the toughest. Um, backhand volley though, I don't really see a big deal of the uh, difference. I actually think backhand volleys might be even be easier than forehand. Like on the backhand, you very often just block it. On the forehand, you actually sometimes in singles, especially you sometimes need to add a bit of, you know, invention for yourself. Um, but uh, backhand overhead is definitely one of the toughest shots in tennis. I said it before, but in amateur tennis, the person who has to hit the most backhands will lose 90% of the time. Uh, yeah, I did say it before. I don't remember what I said back then. <laughs> uh, but... It might make sense. I, th I feel like quite a lot of people will actually feel uh, pretty safe on their backhands. Like they can probably trade with them a little bit more. Like they can probably trade a little more safer with them than their forehands even. But when it comes to like the ability to hit through the ball, definitely for 90% of people, you know, the forehands generate more pace, more penetration. So if we're talking about like losing because the opponent is more aggressive than you, then probably yes. But um, for most people, the backhand swing, I remember talking about this with Jack on one of the streams as well. For most people, the backhand swing is actually a bit more compact and it's just easier to pull off under pressure. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to just hitting through the ball, then certainly uh, most amateur players and most players in general will have an easier time hitting through the ball of their forehands. I mean, that's just biology and sort of how we're built mechanically. Think it's out from Tabilo. He's gonna like ask the Empire, but no. For the love up. <laughs> John playing some table tennis and apparently he won against both Mr. Żelisław Żyżyński and Mr. Maciej Zaremba. Jaisław Żyżyński, by the way, was uh, for a long while, and I think right now he's actually the second to last, but for a long while he was, if you, if you put all the polls alphabetically, he was the last poll in the, on that list. Uh, because he starts with that Z with a dot, which is the last letter of the Polish alphabet, and of course his surname. And currently, I think it's his son, because he gave his son the uh, name Żywisław. <laughs> I guess only for that. Yeah, this is not a real ping pong table I, I saw on these things, so... Is Clay Emma's best surface? Would be cool if she surprised some folks at French Open. Probably not. I mean, 
clay like in Stuttgart, it's a very good profile for her. But I think the slower you get, it's not gonna be nice. Like probably to sort of like make full use of her talent, of her um, ability to strike the ball clean early, you probably gotta go with like a bit of a faster profile. So I think that um, probably yeah, the, the one in Stuttgart kind of falls into the into a different category, but. But Ron Garros, mm, I don't know if she's actually going to be that dangerous there. Like, can you imagine her actually pushing, let's say, Sabalenka or Świątek at Ron Garros? I kind of don't. Today? Sure. Perhaps Indian Wells was a bit of a tell as well with uh, Sabalenka playing Raducanu and... I know the match was like relatively close in terms of the scoreboard, but Emma was not in control for like a single second there. And maybe Joao Fonseca will be getting uh, in control of this match very firmly here. At uh, three games all in the second set, he loses the first point, but he gets the next two. Here, Tabilo approaching the net and getting a pretty tough passing shot from uh, Fonseca. The big serve helps, but Fonseca somehow is still in the point, a bit miraculously, and he will win it too. Big reaction from him. Um, I mean, he barely got to the uh, serve, and in fact, while just like barely getting a racket on it, he made it a little tricky for Tabilo here. Tabilo with this stab volley and definitely had a shot at getting, getting the last volley over the net, but it clips the tape or like, you know, just lands just below the tape. So it's two breakpoints for Fonseca, who is so close to making that Ron Garros qualifying draw. Oh my goodness, such a pass. What a pass here if he made it, but it's just very, very close. I think Tabilo gets the point done, yeah. Um, the serve out wide, lefty, of course. On that side, it's always going to be a threat. And he manages to save the two break points. Garin, by the way, in f like in control over Zverev. 6-4-4-3 four, four, and serving in Munich. Ooh, Fonseca earned himself the right to crack the forehand here, try to control the point, but yeah, he just misses that. So these two break points were saved by Tabilo pretty effectively. Uh, one great serve, the other also a short attacking point where Fonseca had only a small chance for a pass. Zero margin really there, uh, no down the line corridor. And now it's just Tabilo with a game point, so... Perhaps he has just survived what might have been the end of the match even. Another good serve. He approaches the net. Speaking of backhand overheads, Alejandro Tabilo gets it right. I just called it one of the toughest shots in tennis that also holds up at the pro level, but uh, Tabilo gets it right. 6-4-5-3 indeed for Garin over Zverev right now in Munich and in Stuttgart where of course we have John this week. Rybakina has already won. Sabalenka is beating Vondroushova so far 6-3. Can we get a top four semi-final lineup in Stuttgart? Rybakina, Sabalenka, Świątek, Goff. Doesn't sound impossible, that, right? Really? Ghosty also pre prefer. I'm sorry, Ghosty. Uh, John also prefers forehand volleys? I'm a bit surprised by that. I I think I'm more comfortable on my backhand, actually. Um, on the forehand, I just rare, I just often, like, shank it or, you know, just miss, just don't hit it cleanly. German touch tennis. <laughs> Mm. 
do I still have uh, high hopes for Zhuk? Uh, I mean, it looks like he's going to start from scratch, basically, whenever he's back. If I tell you yes, I will sound delusional, right? I, I, I think if I tell you yes, I will sound delusional. <laughs> I mean, I think he clearly has the potential to like be back in Grand Slam qualifying spots, maybe push for the top 100 one year, but obviously what happened to his career the last couple of seasons has been a disaster. Um, I don't know if he'll have it in him mentally to come back as well, because he's always like kind of struggled to me. To me, it seems like he struggled with like a pretty low natural level of confidence. So I know that saying yes will make me sound delusional at this stage. If you're good at tennis, you're, you're likely to be good at all racket sports. If you put in proper practice, yeah, but if you just do it randomly, if you, I don't know, play tennis for 10 years and then pick up a badminton racket, you're not going to be good right away. You're actually going to be even worse than you would be otherwise, I think. Some of what you're used to from uh, from tennis will not be helping you out. Controversial call here. Fonseca disagreeing with the umpire who says that the serve was probably out at 15 all. Would be Joao's point as well because the return didn't make it back over the net. Uh, Garin will soon serve for the match against Zverev in case anyone is interested in that one. That's the second Munich quarterfinal, of course. Kind of funny because Garin has, uh, well, if Garin wins this, he will have four top 10 wins and two of them will be against Zverev in Munich quarterfinals. <laughs> but, um, well, I guess Garin really likes these conditions in Munich like they are this year. And also in 2019, I think it was similar. Like it was very cold. It was very slow, heavy. Uh, probably not a fan of these courts when it's faster like it was last year. 40-15 Fonseca in the meantime, so that dispute over the line call doesn't seem to have impacted him that much. And that's four games all. I think, um, yeah, Zverev was number three when Garin beat him in Munich 2019. Now he's number five, so no parallel there. But, there, but in fact, it's, it's very interesting that over basically five years, uh, Garin has picked up, well, if he, if he claims the match from uh, serving for it, then he will have four top ten wins, and two of them will be in the very same at the very same event at the very against the very same opponent and in the very same round even. One big scare this set so far for uh, Tabilo, of course. These two breakpoints that he had to save recently, uh, what was it, 3-all, right? It was the, the previous service game of his, but for now we are still on serve. He avoided a similar um, outcome as in the, opening, as in the opener when he was just down right away and never, never recovered. He's got Fonseca running from corner to corner here, but can he actually claim the point? Oh my, that's a wild miss. Did he, oh no, he actually made it? Okay, Fonseca actually won the point, but that was not clean. He tracks down the half volley from Tabilo and definitely overheat that forehand, but it seems like it just landed barely inside the baseline. He says sorry as well.
To me, that serve was probably out. Let's see what the umpire says. Fonseca seems pretty confident. Oh no, the 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 umpire actually says it's in. But I think we're gonna be replaying it. So maybe Fonseca was just showing it to him and also expected that call then. Just barely misses his forehand return here cross court. That would have been instantly a point, I think, if he if he landed it. But yeah, it's 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 gonna be just wide. And Garin with three match points. So Alexander Zverev won't win Munich yet again. I mean, he he won it back twice back in 2017, 18. But the last few years at this event have actually been pretty weird for him. I mean, he lost to Rune in 2022 eventual champion but at the time it was still a massive win for Holger and last year he lost to Chris O'Connell in the second round this time 2024 he loses to Garin in the quarters again And Tabilo serves it out 5-4, not much of a scare again. In the meantime, uh, Christian Garin does claim the match over Alexander Zverev, so the top seed is out. It's going to be Fritz against Garin in the first Munich semi-final. Uh, opens up the draw for Rune a little bit more. I mean, Rune will, will face some big hitters, though, so I don't know if he's going to win Munich again, but at least he's not going to have to face Zverev to get that. And as I mentioned earlier, Arnaldi and Ruud have also begun on uh, in Barcelona. Ruud broke uh, almost right away. I mean, yeah, actually right away he went up to... No, no, sorry. He went... That was the second game that he broke. Yeah, second game that he broke. Then Arnaldi broke back. But they're still in that fourth game. So maybe they're going to be playing just as long as Nori very earlier, which despite being a two-set match, it still lasted two and a half hours. Is Zverev's window closing? I think um, if we're talking about like winning a slam, then uh, that's a process that's been happening for a while. In terms of this Australian Open, you have to say that this was a big hit though, right? Because I don't know if he beat Sinner. I mean, I, I, I have no clue if he beat Sinner. But that choke against Medvedev in the semis, like that's just something he could not afford. And uh, at the Australian Open, we, pro we probably got a very clear indication that Zverev is not really behind these guys in terms of like, you know, not, not quite like Tsitsipas or maybe even Medvedev. I mean, maybe he's even closer to them in terms of like the peak level at Grand Slams, but he's always had mental issues at these big stages, right? I mean, he's always choked away some of these matches, like the one against Team, of course at the US Open, the, the main example. But even this year in, in Australia, I think we just saw that he wasn't ready to make the final. And if he's not ready now, will he ever be? And again, I don't know if he beat Sinner, but he definitely would have been fresher than Medvedev going into the final. So that's kind of um, the worst part about this forum that uh, it feels like the window was certainly very open in January. The chance to make his second Grand Slam final was there. 
basically lying in front of him on the floor and he didn't take it. Five games all. Fonseca still very clean on serve this set. I don't think he's really had any issues what so far holding, has he? Yeah, he was two two sets to love up on team. He was briefly a break up in the third as well. He had that tie break when team was only slicing his backhand because he was so tired. And uh he also didn't take that. So but I mean, sure, like one time it can happen to you, but this Australian Open was similarly brutal, I think. Just, uh, again, I, I don't know if he would have beaten Sinner, but like just get another chance, right? Just just get yourself another chance. And yeah, in the second set, actually, Fonseca has only lost three points on serve so far. So in a way, he's actually been kind of dominant <laughs> over Tabilo. <laughs> no, I mean, we can't say that. It's only been really one game that Tabilo was in trouble in. But but um, yeah, it's, it's kind of impressive how easily the Brazilian has been getting through this one and it is 15 all now uh, i don't know uh, lexi says that it's time to break now for fonseca let's see if he can make that happen the first point from tabito was actually pretty great uh with the drop shot finish now they're trading fonseca's backhand cross court against the tabilo forehand and it's a nice counter from the Chilean eventually as Fonseca tries to get to his forehand finally. Uh, but that shot does not actually give him that much over Tabilo here. Uh, the flatter backhand once again makes it pretty tough for Fonseca to get his favorite contact point on the forehand. And it's just such an unpleasant ball. I think it's an ace from Tabilo too, so it's looking more and more likely that, that to win this match in two sets, Tabilo, uh, Fonseca might have to win another tiebreak. Against Radu Albot, there was one tiebreak. Against Lorenzo Sonego, there was one tiebreak. Maybe there will be one against Alejandro Tabilo too. Oh, still not done though. Very sloppy from Tabilo here. I'm not really sure what his intention was even, but he kind of got caught in no man's land after this Fonseca return, trying to play this half volley pickup from like the third, let's say, you know, 75% deep into the court. Uh, Butter return into the net gives him his uh, sixth game of the set. And now it's going to be pressure on Fonseca to uh, just hold and get us to a tiebreak. <laughs> and we have Vansh, our favorite, uh, with um, a perfect tweet, you know, Tommy Paul. 2-0, Alexander Bublik 3-1, and Christian Garin 2-1 are now a combined 7-2 against Alexander Zverev. <laughs> Ask me again, I mean, who, uh, you know, what sort of um, connection is there between Paul, Bublik, and Garin? We like making fun of Vansh, but, um, well, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. He also misspelled the name of Christian Garin. There's no CH at the beginning. It's it's just C, right? So that Dios mio Fonseca time to break now from Lexi didn't work out, but uh, let's see what he's made of here. I mean, the, the, the hold at 5-6 is never easy, right? I remember when I was this massive Federer fan, of course, like 2017, 16, and every single time he would be in like 5-6 in a set, he would have this weaker game and had, have to, had to save like three break points. There was this patch when it just happened every single match. And I remember like dreading these five, six games, you know. 
against Grigor, for example, in Basel, uh, 7 6 6 2. And that was ar around that time. Maybe that's actually late 2014 and then uh, early 2015. I think so. First point goes to Tabilo, adding a bit more spin trading against the Fonseca backhand. Of course, um, lefty righty pattern. And it's the Brazilian who sends one wide first. So this is actually just the fourth point that Fonseca lost on serve in this set. And um, well, if you've only lost three points in five games, in theory, you should expect to win the next one. But of course, that's not how tennis works, really. That's incredible. That that that's an incredible way to well lose a point eventually. Fonseca didn't have much control on that volley. Uh, chasing down a Tabilo drop shot, Tabilo tries to pass him, and it seemed like Fonseca might eventually just you know get a clean hit on the racket, catch it, anticipate well. And just hit it into the open court. But um, yeah, he just wasn't controlling that volley well, given sort of position he was playing it from. Oh my god, and he's he's in trouble here again. Somehow survives. This is a crazy point. I mean, Fonseca was smashing the ball already. Uh, he kind of jumped to it and it wasn't a great smash at all. Like he didn't get that much momentum into it. Then Tabilo lobs him. Fonseca tracks it down, plays this, uh, like it wasn't a tweener, but he just sort of, you know, lobbed it back with his back behind the court. And he eventually wins the point as well. Like this might be such an important moment if Fonseca wins this game in the set, because this was at low 30. And this rally could have gone wrong for him on like five different occasions. He was actually pretty fortunate to, to win it. The, the lob with his back behind the court was like really deep. And Tabilo also couldn't smash it, you know, with, with proper force without risking too much, at least. Fairly all now. Yeah, I mean, that, that might be the most important point of the match if Fonseca wins in two now. But that 5-6 hold is definitely proving quite crucial and quite nervy. Another drop shot from Tabilo, and this one is going to be perfect. Fonseca not going to catch it, but also like moved back a little bit in this point. Tabilo punishes him for it. So already in one game, Fonseca has lost as many points this set on serve as he lost. And well, in, in one game, basically, Fonseca has lost as many points on serve as he lost in the first five service games in this set. Finds the first serve, but the return is in. He pushes Tabilo White to the forehand and what a winner. Whew, I mean... Right now, at least that low 30 point isn't going to be the turning point, isn't going to be the crucial moment if he wins the match in two. It's going to be this one. Lovely control on these couple of forehands too because they were very aggressive, but at the same time, you could see that, you know, he's got the composure, he's got the uh, margin on them. Let's see. I mean, it's still deuce. Aggressive backhand cross court was a little out of position after the inside in, which wasn't placed that well, but uh, the power on it is still enough to make Tabilo miss. So it's a game point for Fonseca now. Saving a set point in this game at 5, 6, 30, 40. He really missed that? Okay, maybe the 
the quality of my streaming is uh, making me see things. But the banana forehand from Fonseca must have been pretty close to the point to the line. Wow, that's incredible now. That's maybe the best shot of the match. At Deuce, Fonseca goes for the backhand down the line here. Of a pretty high ball from Tabilo as well. And manages to find it just, you know, the sweet spot down the line. Huh. And what a shot as well on the next point. I mean, inside and forehand. In a way, that was a more impressive service game from Fonseca than the five previous ones in this set. I mean, just the composure under pressure. But uh, it is a tiebreak. So he is now seven points away, essentially, from getting into Ron Garros qualifying and getting into his first ATP Tour semifinal. This point really should have been Tabilos, and he might regret it. Fonseca's backhand cross-court pass was okay, but definitely not enough for Tabilo to just dump the volley into the middle of the net. And uh, it's an early mini break for Fonseca. But it seems like that mini break is very quickly gifted back with a double fault. Unreturned serve, um, definitely quite a savior here. I mean, any three points you can get in this scenario. He puts a lot of pressure on Tabilo with the return here too, and it's 3-1 for Fonseca. So here he has restored the mini break advantage. Very high, very fast pace as well in this tie break. And in general, I mean, both guys don't really take that much between the points, right? They're kind of like no-nonsense no, no tennis. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Trading down the middle now. And it's again that flatter backhand of Tabilo into the Fonseca forehand that gives him a ton of trouble. And uh, one of the forehands say lo says long. Still free to up, still one mini break, but um, well... We'll have to wait and see if he clinches the next two points so that this advantage would really stand out. Yeah, I think Fonseca makes a pretty simple unforced error here. A lot of nerves from both players so far in the second set tiebreak. Um, I don't know. I mean, 5-6 game when Fonseca um, was uh, trying to serve to stay in the set. He was also 
very tight at first, but then when it once it actually came to the crunch, he suddenly found this miraculous composure. I don't know if that happens yet again here, but we'll see. Three, three points all anyway. Uh, one more serve for the 17-year-old. <laughs> and yeah, just speaking of nerves, I mean, that was such a good idea from Tabiro uh, to follow up that second serve return into the net. I mean, it clearly flustered Fonseca, but what the hell was he thinking with the next shot? Again, I'm not really even sure what Tabiro was attempting to do. I think it was supposed to be like a longer forehand slice, maybe maybe wrong footing Fonseca, but since it's like really middle of the net, it's it's pretty hard to say what his intention was. 4-3 Fonseca, as both players have definitely had their fair share of mishaps in the tiebreak. And this first serve from Tabilo really comes in handy. It's worth everything at the moment. Four points all. Aye, Fonseca adding quite a lot of spin here on the forehand. It's heavy, but it's out. So 5-4 Tabilo on serve, but given how the last few points have looked, there's no guarantees anymore. There's absolutely no guarantees when it comes to winning points on your own delivery. Everything can happen here. Anything, actually, I should have said. Um, four or five Fonseca, what can he produce on this one? At least he keeps himself in the rally for now, but he's going to be the one making an error first. It's a forehand into the net. So two set points for Tabilo. He already had one at five, six, 30, 30 40. And now... Um, the last few points has been Fonseca, who's like not really up to the challenge at the moment. Can he suddenly regain composure just like he did in the 5 6 game when it was so tough on him? He just found it right, you know, out of nowhere. Well, for now, looks like Tabilo is not going to ask the question on this one. Second serve again for Fonseca, and Tabilo just throws it out. But he's going to have that one set point on his serve now, and this is the one that's the most important. Of course, Tabilo has this pretty quick service motion, lots of snap on the wrist. We'll see if he can just locate that first serve, as in the tiebreak, it's been proving quite crucial. First serve is in, and he will serve and volley the set to an end. 6-4 Fonseca first set, 7-6 Tabilo in the second. For the entire, almost the entire second set, it was Fonseca who was getting through his service games easy, easier. It was Fonseca who was seemingly on the front foot, but he missed a couple of breakpoints at three games all. And after that, Tabilo kind of regained his footing in the match. Manages to claim the tiebreak, which was definitely a nervy affair from both players. And we are going into the third set. Just an hour and 35 minutes. It hasn't been the longest two, set, uh, you know, two sets we've ever seen. So probably fatigue will not be that much of a factor yet, you would assume. But uh, we'll see. I mean, the momentum, the confidence are definitely with Tabilo at the moment.
in Munich, Hisler and Rune are also on the court right now. And Arnaldi and Ruud, after nine games, they are on serve in Barcelona. But, well, even though they are on serve, it's not like they've always been. They've already had four breaks. If Fonseca loses, he can't qualify for the French. Um, it's going to be tricky. I mean, he will be on the verge. He is currently about 240. I mean, he's currently 240 in the um, live rankings. He might still be passed by a couple of players. Uh, by this couple of players, I basically mean Gaubas or Faria, I think. Gaubas if he wins the title. Faria if he wins today against Gaubas. He could also be passed by Vincent Ruggeri if he wins today. And he could also be passed by Kruger if he wins Tallahassee, Olivo if he wins Tukuman, Tuglin Wu if he beats Gwang, if he wins Gwangyu. So let's assume that he would be like 241, which at the Australian Open was not enough. At the Australian Open, even after all of these withdrawals, uh, 239 ended up being the cut. Obviously, some fluctuation one way or the other is um, definitely possible. So who knows? I mean, basically, he would be on the verge. It would be uh, pretty nervous until the end, like for him. Like he, he, will, he will not be guaranteed to make it. He will be waiting probably until the last moment if he loses today. And we are back right away. No toilet break, no anything. Ooh, and Tabilo is flying right now with this return one to punch. Low 30, I think, already. I mean, Nori defeat, is that a surprise? Was he even the favorite against Echeverri? Zverev was definitely a bit uh, overrated, but yeah, it's still a relative surprise. Yeah, I would say that uh, Nori was not even the favorite, probably against Edge. Uh, Root, by the way, took the first set, and we have three break points right away uh, for Joao, for Alejandro Tabilo, who's taking that second set finish and taking it really. Uh, you know, in order to start dominating here. I'm a little surprised that we were, you know, back playing right away, that Fonseca didn't, like, I don't know, take a bit of a toilet break or something like that. That's usually what you see players do, but, well. Seems like so far he hasn't been able to reset himself. Saves the first breakpoint as Stabilo dumps the return into the net. But now it's actually time to start winning some points. And he does just that here with this uh, pretty sharp backhand at the middle. Tabilo doesn't really know what to do with it. Eventually just ends up flying the forehand very wide. Just one more breakpoint now. And I think it's an ace, deuce. So... Well, I'm not saying that this one break would have meant that the match is over. Obviously, in the second set, there were no breaks whatsoever, the entire 12 games. But, um, I mean, you still don't want to fall behind. Let's see, though. Um, Deuce, Tabilo, kind of in control, but I think he has surrendered it by now. Mm, trying to open up the court with this backhand angle from Seca, but he lands it into the net. So far, this definitely has the feeling of like, you know, all the energy, all the intensity that Fonseca was playing with Kaida kind of going away. I mean, if he somehow sneaks his way into winning this first game anyway, maybe we he can kind of just avoid that and come back with renewed forces really soon. But we'll see. Fourth breakpoint for now. He gets a chance to crack the forehand, but I think it's going to be out. 
the body language is of course getting more negative to well this is going to be rough now this is going to be really tough for the 17 year old who is trying to turn this around lock up his run garros qualifying spot mm. i mean i understand you being pissed but i'll just i can just tell you that it wasn't the best tiebreaker i've ever seen definitely it was quite nervous actually for both guys I'm not Francais. And um, as long as I understand Pablo, uh, we cannot show the video, we cannot show the stream. We would be taken off, we would be banned. Ooh, I mean, Fonseca is kind of letting it loose right now out of frustration, but he finds this ridiculous backhand cross court because of that. Yeah, spraying it uh, a lot, especially Fonseca, quite a few easy points for Tabila on save, just overall all over the place from both guys, you know. And Fonseca kind of didn't manage to reset himself until the third set, but now he's fairly low up. So maybe this match has a lot more twists left in store for us. We'll see. And yes, indeed, as now Fonseca has three break points. Uh, after the first point, it's kind of just two random errors from Tabilo. So maybe you'll just trade breaks right away at the start of the decider. Of course, there weren't any in the second set. But um, that doesn't mean that just one here would have to end the match. It's just a little weird to see Tabilo drop all of that momentum that he had and... all of that power that he seemingly came into the decider with but let's see i mean still it's just two, it's just three break points right he can still lose this i mean he can still save this but the empire is down from his chair and he's disputing with fonseca here Fonseca claims that the Tabilo forehand was probably out. The umpire says it touches the line, so it's going to be a point for Tabilo. No break yet. I think Fonseca thought he broke. Let me see on the replay how it looks. Ah, I mean, from the replay, it's going to be very hard to say anything, but that will be a point for Tabilo. He was basically millimeters away from... Uh, giving that break back to Fonseca. Two more break points, though. And this time he misses the forehand, right? I believe so, yeah. So I just... <laughs> I have to say, I mean, this is just very... I don't know if unexpected, but... Just to give away a break like this, pretty sloppy when Fonseca was clearly frustrated. Fonseca was clearly a bit distraught after losing that second set. You know, it's just not going to cut it, right? Like, it's just something that Tabilo should have avoided, I think. But he didn't. So we are back on serve in the third set. And now it's Tabilo who kind of doesn't know what to do. 
hitting balls pretty hard, but like with no real sense of direction, point, point construction and idea how to craft the points here. This maybe this will just remain that sort of a nervy affair until the very end now, after the end of the second set. I mean, Tabilo is just unable to put a shot into the court at the moment. Basically broke in the first game of the third set and then for two games, he's just completely out of it. Finally gets a return in and he will win the point as well, but that's at 40 love. And it's 2-1 Fonseca. Well, the last three games were definitely quite weird. Fonseca coming out deflated after the second set, but suddenly it's Tabilo who drops all that intensity. We are back on serve, we are back at 2-1 Fonseca, and he's still not out of this match. Kasper Ruud in the meantime leading Matteo Arnaldi 6-4, one game in the second set, and now Ferdi Love on the Arnaldi serve too. It will be pretty funny if Ruth and Tsitsipas play each other again, right? One, uh, play each other again in the final, right? And this time they will also both have some sort of like new thing to achieve, right? Because in Monte Carlo, of course, it was just Casper with the 500, uh, well, a title above the 250 level. But now Tsitsipas would have that uh, ATP 500 to win, where he's like 0 and 10 in finals. And Casper is still the same, uh, a title bigger than the 250. But still a few players who can stop them. Uh, maybe especially Fields if he just fires up. Rune so far up an early break over Mark andrea Hisler. He actually leads the um, trails the head to head. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but he trails the head to head with Hisler 1 2, uh, losing to him in Bostad 2022 and Sofia 2022. The only time he beat him was Montpellier 2023. I don't know if it actually is very relevant for this match in Munich, but um, well, the slower conditions probably don't help Usler that much. I like his chances if it was warmer and he was able to just use that slight altitude in Munich, but I don't know if after all that rain and the chilly weather, uh, if that's actually a nice matchup for Hisler in such conditions. Also, obviously, his form this year has been, or especially even 2023, was quite poor. Well, Tabilo can't shake himself out of this so far. Loses the first point once again, just dumping a shot into the net for, for like no reason. But he will need to do it pretty quickly. Like, let's imagine Fonseca goes 4 1 up here with the next two games. That would be very hard to recover from. Tabilo needs to start putting shots in play at the very least. Well, it will help him out slightly if Fonseca is missing returns, but. Well, he was trying to be aggressive, just mistimed it. I think he's complaining about the bounce as well. Well, as I said, the, the matches that we've been watching this week in Bucharest, they've definitely had their issues with how the courts are prepared, even before all the rain. Because, of course, after the rain, there, there were some issues with that too, the ground being unsuitable. And just even though it was clear weather, uh, they had to keep moving uh, the starts of the, the, the beginning time of the, some of the matches. But um, yeah, the bounces have been a bit of a problem. On the other hand, like Fonseca just can't just allow Tabilo to have it all his way, right? And just stand two meters behind the baseline and hope he misses. And he learned it the hard way here. 
once again Tabilo spotting it very well going for that backhand drop shot there's been a two or three rallies maybe in this match when Fonseca did that just moving back two three steps trying to uh, lure out an error from Tabilo but uh, the Chilean so far has been just really good at shutting the, these attempts down and it seems like he is getting back into this uh, set Nice plus one forehand here, just very safely, wrong footing, Fonseca. Not many first serves in this game for Tabilo, but For now, he's 40-15 up anyway, so. And I think he actually finds it on the line now. Yeah, so two games all. Good moment for him to break himself out of that short, uh, dry spell. Uh, of course, in the in the first set, he also had something similar, right? Where like just for 10 minutes, he couldn't, couldn't reproduce anything. And then he loses four games in a row. Now it's two all in the third set, as we still know nothing. Yeah, that, that half volley will not be good enough from Fonseca. Tabilo hits him on the back. Definitely, this is starting to feel like more of a battle of nerves right now, with both guys just making questionable shot selection choices. But someone will need to win this match and someone will actually come out on top. Some better serving from Fonseca right now, two in a row, unreturned out wide, unreturned down the tee. The longer we keep going, the more important this will be as well. Uh, yes, Ghosty Root has won more uh, matches than anyone else on the ATP Tour this year. I think he's at what at twenty six right now, if memory serves right. Um, it was also pretty funny in February because there was a moment when Jordan Thompson was a leader of that stat. Is that con I mean that's one con one double fault from Fonseca, but also a pretty. Awful forehand error here. And this is getting very tricky, but he lands that backhand volley. Breakpoint down. Uh, double fault at 30 15. Uh, pretty poor forehand error at 30 all. But now that the pressure is really on, he finds the backhand down the line, he approaches the net and manages to cap it off as well. Wasn't the perfect approach, but he managed to make up for it with the volley. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's definitely a, a little less cautious at the moment than he was previously.
choosing these forehands down the line here. Like that's not really a shot that we've seen him go for in this match for the most part. At least not um, kind of like, you know, so aggressively out of position. And it's another break point for Tabilo. Can Fonseca survive this time? Tries to go back and drop shot cross court and it's, it falls be, basically even be, before the net. So it's another break, break for Tabilo who even says sorry to Fonseca. I'm not really sure for what. Maybe again the bounce was a little uncomfortable. But um, for the second time this set, Alejandro Tabilo goes up a break. And uh, last time it actually wasn't that tricky for Fonseca to recover, right? I mean... Tabilo kind of gifted him that second game of the set. He will be hoping for something similar here. Is Tabilo going to surpass Jari as Chile's top bloke? It might uh, at some point, like it might, um, it, it might happen if Jari um, keeps losing his points, basically. For now, it's not close to that yet, but... Um... If when it comes to the ATP race, for example, I believe Tabilo is probably higher, right? Tabilo is number 20 and Jari is number 29. So this year, Tabilo has already earned 200 more points than Jari. And if he wins this match, he's going to have 250 more points than Jari. So like it's, it's possible. The pressure of the French qualifying, maybe that, maybe the uh, sheer, you know, ATP semi-final. It's quite a lot of pressure here for, on him. Am I surprised Mahat Zhang are one of the best players in the world at the moment? Uh, I think to, to call them that, we would still need to see like maybe a bit more of an extended patch of, um, you know, just prolonged success from them. But obviously this year they have a fantastic record. Uh, Mahat and Zhang with one another. Uh, they've only played like what three events, right? Uh, but they won the title in Marseille, now the semis in Barcelona, and also uh, semi finals in at the Australian Open. But uh, if you think about it, like it makes sense, right? Both of them return very aggressively, which is good in doubles. Zhang has all that big power, good reach as well. And Mahach is just such a skilled player. Uh, the way he takes the returns so early, like that's that's superb in doubles because you never want to give the opponents any like any time on the ball. If you just put the return safely in play, then the guy standing at the net will just pick it up, right? Whereas uh, Mahaj doesn't really allow them to do that. And in general, he's he's got such amazing hands and feel. I think this pairing makes a lot of sense. Um, would I already call them one of the best in the world? I mean, it depends how low we want to go down. But but yeah, obviously, the, the last three events, they've been very, very good. The only three events that they've played with one another. Yeah, second serve was very... Um, does, that, does that difference suggest a change in tactics on second serve returns? Not really. I mean, in the second set, it was just very serve dominated from both guys. But um, I would say that Tabilo was just much, much cleaner than in the opener. You know, in the opener, Tabilo had this 10 minute patch where he just wasn't putting anything in play. And um, that probably was more of a factor in that stat. Um, Maupa y Maupa. I mean, Świątek and Raducanu will not be going until after Sabalenka and Vondroushov are done, basically. So, Has Root ever beat Sinner? Um, hmm. Let me check that, actually. I I'm, doesn't, doesn't come to mind right away. Yeah, just two matches years ago, both in Vienna, 2020, 2021. So they've only played twice and both were won by Yannick. So uh, it's not an accident that they, that the match where Ruth beat Sinner was not coming to mind. 40-15, Tabilo.
Yeah, that's kind of his bread and butter when uh, Fonseca lifted that forehand. I already knew this wasn't going to end well. Uh, hitting through that flatter backhand cross court, that's kind of Tabilo's. Maybe even Tabilo's best shot. And he goes for two up, this time avoiding that um, already, like, you know, just a horrible game right after a break, like at the beginning of the third, of the third set. So he consolidates. He's in a very comfortable position right now. And let's see if he can keep pushing for this. Great forehand on the line here, too. Maybe we're just seeing the last moments of this of this match now as, uh, well, Fonseca's game has broken down a little bit. Love 30. And similarly, like in the opening set, when Fonseca was a double break up, that double break lead would be very... Um, Yeah, just very comfortable and kind of decisive already. That That's how it would feel at least. Let's see if Tabilo can get it. Back and drop shot from Fonseca into the net. So it's three break points for Tabilo for a 5-2 lead. Ooh, and that's so much luck for Tabilo as well on the break point. But let's be honest, it's not like a point that decides the match, right? The match has already been decided, it seems. And Tabilo breaks indeed for 5-2 and he will serve for the match. Fonseca needs to do an, the unthinkable here to survive. And we'll see if he has it in him. But since the second set tiebreak onwards, it just, just hasn't been the same for the 17-year-old. Five to up, Alejandro Tabilo to serve for the match. He's pumped up. He is ready for it. He shows a clenched fist to his box, getting cheers from them as he is going to attempt to serve out this match, make an eight, make another ATP Tour semifinal, and fend off the seventeen-year-old Joao Fonseca to put him in a pretty tricky position ahead of, well. I mean, that, that's kind of all you can do. I mean, just, just put him in a position where it's not clear if Fonseca will make Ron Garros qualifying or not. But obviously, if he loses this match, there's nothing he, he can do anymore. Gets the first point done here. Maybe it's going to be a similar story as in the opening set when Fonseca was serving at 5-2 and then uh, Tabilo broke back once. We'll see.
Ooh, Tabilo trying to hit this forehand like fully on the run. It was quite a risky attempt, but of course he has a bit of a um, um, leeway, something to fall back on, given that basically he can lose his serve here and still nothing will happen. Serves like this, though, are really helping him out now. On the ad side, he is just going down the tee and getting point after point. Fonseca this time like screaming really loudly after missing this return. But well, it's just it's just a really good serve from Tabilo too. I guess Fonseca was like naturally expecting that out wide direction from a left hander, but down the tee, Tabilo found a great one here. And actually two points in a row on that side too. 30 all. Match point or break point? Once again, the moment Fonseca gets defensive. Tabilo comes up with a drop shot, but he gets uh, kind of like just um, scammed here even by Fonseca. I think, yeah, this was a pretty good fake out. Uh, he was not expecting that sort of shot from Fonseca, the, the longer forehand slice response. And uh, it's a break point for the 17 year old actually. So maybe the match is not done yet. Maybe we still have one more twist coming up. Goes for the forehand inside in, but Tabilo is defending well. Tries to locate the cross court winner. There's gonna be, it's gonna be close. The umpire is checking the mark and he says it's what? It's in, yeah. So it's a break for Fonseca. Five games to three. He's gotten one of the breaks back. Loosened up a little. Uh, we'll see. Tabilo showed out instantly when that ball landed. Um, honestly, it was super close on the replay, so I can't really blame him for that. But Fonseca finds the line with it, so one of the breaks has been erased, but still two more games to go, only to level the match. Just not going to be easy. Of course, we know Fonseca already is a bit of a comeback master, right? Um, sometimes in sets, sometimes in matches. Recently in Asuncion against Orlando Luz, for example. Uh, Orlando Luz had, I think, two match points on serve at 5-4 in the second set. Lost that one. We'll see. Um, it's probably going to be a bit hard in the next game to like play as freely as he did here, right? That's probably the main challenge. As uh, by the next, like this this time at 2-5, Fonseca was already pretty loose, right? Was just thinking, okay, so I lost this match. Uh, I can just swing a little bit more freely now. Whereas by the time we get to 5-4, he's going to be feeling a bit more pressure on his shoulders. He's already going to be thinking about what if I complete this comeback. And by the way, I'm already talking about 5-4 because this next game is just going very very smoothly for the youngster might be over in a flash and yes indeed it will so 5-4 and indeed similarly like in the opening set 5-2 lead for Fonseca there was uh, one break but he holds at 6-4 and holds easily uh, at 5-4 now Tabilo gets the chance to do the same 5-2 lead one break you can lose the second one we will now find out after the change of ends. Who is winning? I mean, Tabilo will serve for the match. Does any of your tennis knowledge translate to ping pong? Um, in what sense? You mean like knowing players and stuff? Um, I know like maybe 50 top, like like I maybe know like the top 50 in the world in table tennis. If when it comes to like describing their games, probably like 15, 20. If we're talking about tactics and stuff in matches, it's very different, I would say.
Ta table tennis might be even more serve return oriented than tennis is. In fact, I'm pretty sure it is. And sort of who gets the first uh, first strike, who gets uh, sort of some pretty decent spin on the third ball. Should you try ponchki, which is pretty much donuts, but um, kind of a little different? Uh, I mean, you might. I personally don't like them too much. Uh, there's this one Polish um, holiday when uh, people are like expected to eat ponchki. <laughs> and I'm not even joking. Like it's, uh, it's called Fat Thursday. <laughs> but I never do that. First point goes to Tabilo. 5-4, 15 love. Let's see if he can hold his nerve and get over the line. Well, again, the serve down the tee will really help. Tennis skills translate to ping pong a little bit, I think, but it's actually the other way around. It's ping pong skills that translate to tennis. Uh, I, I I think it's the other way around, but uh, but yeah, I think surprise surprisingly yes. Um, three match points, uh, some big serving here from Tabilo, and seeming uh, you know similarly to Fonseca in the first set, uh, that second attempt to serve it out is just not causing him any issues so far. Now a second set though, we'll see if Fonseca can keep fighting or not. And he dumps his backhand into the net. Alejandro Tabilo is through to the Bucharest semifinals. 4-6, 7-6, 6-4. Beat Joao Fonseca, the 17-year-old who will now be on the verge of the Roland Garros qualifying cut. For a couple of weeks at least, we, will, we won't know that much. Because even when the list comes out, which I think will be in two weeks' time, and it's going to be the ranking from... Monday in a couple of the from the from from Monday the, the one in the in a couple of days, the cut will still have Fonseca out. I'm pretty sure, but then after withdrawals, wild cards, I think it's gonna be a bit of a nervy affair unless they really give him a qualifying wild card. Which uh, I don't know if the FFT is gonna go for something like this. Like main draw, they definitely aren't. I'm hundred percent sure. At least that's what it seems. You know, Alcaraz wasn't getting them. So I don't think he will, but um, but that's gonna be it from Fonseca and Tabilo today. I'm rooting for Fonseca to give us all other tiebreak. Ah, another tiebreak. Um, yeah. So that's basically the situation with the ranking of Fonseca right now. Tabilo, another semi-final, of course, a fantastic season from him so far. Number 20 in the ATP race. That's um, that's absolutely awesome. And he will face Marton Fucovic in the semi-finals. These are the two semi-finals we've already got in Bucharest. Of course, the other two will also be known later today. Uh, basically, Barrer and Martinez are already in the third set. Uh, Pedro probably got a bit more, well, a bit less rest, given that his uh, uh, second round earlier today was much longer. But we'll see if he can um, actually prevail over Barrer. And Serundolo, and Serundolo against Navone should be on the court pretty soon as well, after Fonseca Tabilo to play that fourth quarter final. There, Navone was the guy who played earlier, but also had the longer match, so maybe the balance of fatigue will be a little um, clear, well, will be a little more even there. But yeah, for now, we just know that tomorrow Tabilo will face Fucovic. Um, nothing else left to add, I guess. I know we have this one guy there in the... I actually had my uh, laptop muted. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, no. I had my, I had my laptop muted. So. Ah, okay. Just one question, I think, which is... Do you think maybe not playing the French Open, qualifying, etc., there is a, a positive spin to put on that if that does end up being the case? Is there something, you know, maybe this would have come too soon for him anyway and 
maybe he can play some other tournament maybe a bit more suited to his level there, there'll be a challenger in Bonn that he, he he would be a great addition for during the French Open. There's no tro there's no Trozer this year. Um, oh no! Oh no! Yeah, it's, it's not on the calendar. Yeah. Um, I mean, oh, I know what you mean. If he doesn't get into Roland Garros, he gets into Wimbledon anyway. Like he he doesn't really? have much to defend. I mean, he doesn't have much to defend in the next few weeks. So I think he will be at Wimbledon anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's I don't think it's a massive. Let's get him I, I don't think it's a massive setback. He can go to Surbiton then. He could, but yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think it's a massive setback. Basically, uh, if he doesn't, yeah, yeah, it would be fun to see him there, obviously. But um, I don't. Do think you think it's a he's setback. played on grass or much on grass? Well, Wimbledon last year, yeah. We oh, Wimbledon, okay, right. Roehampton. I think he might have actually even won Roehampton. Let me check that quickly. But Roehampton is that one J1 uh, junior event that is before Wimbledon, and like every single player who plays Wimbledon uh, is there. Uh, well, actually, you know, it's, it's also held in the, at the same course as Wimbledon qualifying, so he would be familiar with the venue. Yeah. Uh, he indeed won Roehampton, yeah, last year. And then it, at Wimbledon, I think it was a quarterfinal appearance from him. Okay. All right. Roehampton, is that, is that what it's called? Is that the actual name of the... Because there's also this... There's two uh, t uh, things happening at Surbiton. One is a challenger, and then there's something else. I think it may be called the Lexus Trophy, mm. although that might be the challenger. There's Lexus two events. Trophy Lexus Trophy is okay, the Lexus Trophy. Okay, so that's yeah. the challenger. But then there's another one for the for the women, I think, maybe in Serbia yeah. a week or so later. Um, I think is it's that a, like it's a, a W? Combined, it's a combined event, I think. But yeah, oh, uh, yes, but, it is a combined event. You're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the uh, same week. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do they want to say? Uh, ah, Roehampton is the Wimbledon qualifying venue. Yeah, got it. Got it. And that's, oh, in well, the, anyway. that's in the first week of Wimbledon, and then the second week of Wimbledon is the junior event. So basically, every single time, like all juniors play both. And Fonseca won Roehampton last year before losing to Henry Serrell, the eventual champion in the qualify in the quarterfinals at Wimbledon. But of course, in the pros, he hasn't had an opportunity to play on grass. Cool. I can see the live score has switched to Sarundalo against Navoni, but I'm afraid if you're a Navoni or a Sarundalo fan and you're thinking we're going to stay here for another two or three hours talking about that, then you are wrong. Uh, Damien is going to sail off into the sunset uh, um, of deepest, darkest Poland. Uh, we will see you briefly, though, in a few hours um, post uh, Emiradu Kanu, Igor Svjontek, right? So yeah, absolutely. To come um but yeah i'm not gonna talk anything about um that because i think that's to come later and uh yeah but everyone thanks for tuning in we are actually we're adding our subscriber count quite nicely this week um thanks to the aforementioned ego and emma doing uh winning matches in in stuttgart definitely but also of course thanks to these watch along so do hit the like button and do subscribe and um yeah we'll see you for the post-match thoughts on uh emma versus eager later because we'll also be bringing that as a live watch along with uh the two jameses james uh aka tennis ranter but also jamie jubon and then kira will be bringing us kostuk against coca goss so basically we are just live until main tour tennis finishes put it that way i made sure i got the main tour in there damien because i'm sure there's something going on in the americas is there any challenges happening in the americas this week Oh, obviously. Tallahassee, Acapulco. Uh, so, Tucuman. Yeah. Tucuman, and Ta Tucuman playing already. Tallahassee, not yet. Um, Oairash as well, of course, at the moment. Cool. So anyway, uh, yeah, cheers for that. And um, speak to you all soon. I'm going to hit the end button and uh, Damien, you can just close your windows. See you later. Bye. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on all things tennis.